Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers, Professor Yu Yu, and uh, everyone else who has made the visit so uh, hospitable. Uh, this is my first first trip to China, uh, to Shanghai, of course. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to sharing uh, lattice-based cryptography with you. Um, I, uh, having come from the other side of the world, I've had a couple of difficult evenings uh, with not too much sleep, but I feel energized uh, to be here now, so I, I hope to tell you uh, about the fundamentals of lattice-based cryptography. So the outline of the talk uh, is there are three main parts that we will uh, discuss. First, I will tell you a bit about uh, lattices, what are they mathematically, and uh, what are some of the hard problems that we define on lattices. And then the bulk of the talk will be about the uh, so-called short integer solution, or SIS, and learning with errors problems, or LWE and some of their basic uh, cryptographic applications and constructions of crypto systems based on these uh, two problems. And these two problems have become uh, really central to lattice-based cryptography. Almost everything in lattices is now based on, uh, at least in modern times, is now based on uh, these two problems. And then in the third part, I'll discuss a little bit about using um, what are called rings to make uh, the crypto systems even more efficient while still uh, seemingly preserving uh, their security. And I would just like to mention, uh, if you have any questions as things come up, please uh, don't be shy, raise your hand, and, and ask uh, any questions that may arise. It's much more interesting to, to give a talk with interaction uh, and people asking questions. So uh, please feel free, and we have plenty of time to uh, answer questions that, that you may have as we go along. All right. So let's begin with, with part one, uh, or actually before, just an introduction. Um, the cryptography that we've used today, uh, very popular cryptography that we've used today since the late 1970s, uh, for example, the RSA system or the Diffie-Hellman system and all of the uh, cryptography that's been built upon and based upon those systems, uh, these crypto systems are based on problems which we conjecture uh, to be hard. For example, we may conjecture that it is difficult to factor the product of two large primes into those uh, primes themselves. Or we may conjecture that it is difficult to compute uh, discrete logarithms um, in various groups, for example, on elliptic curves or in other uh, multiplicative groups, modulo p. Unfortunately, or uh, in the, in the mid-1990s, uh, Peter Shore gave a really remarkable result, which says that these two problems, factoring and, and discrete log, uh, among a few others, are actually uh, not difficult for a quantum computer. So these problems are not hard, they are easy for a quantum computer. And in principle, one can uh, feed the input n, this number n, into this number n into uh, a quantum computer, whatever that looks like. Here we have a, an ordinary computer, but Schrodinger's cat is inside of it and uh, is doing quantum computations. And in the end, the computer will efficiently produce the two uh, prime factors of n. Similarly, uh, Shor's algorithm also computes discrete logarithms uh, efficiently using a quantum computer. So if you give it a generator and uh, a value g to the x in a group, an arbitrary uh, cyclic group, then it will find uh, that exponent x efficiently. And so this breaks all of uh, the commonly used public key cryptography that uh, we have used over the past 40 years. So this, is, this was a big concern in the 1990s when this first came out. And uh, fortunately for cryptographers, the uh, quantum computers have not been built to be big enough to actually solve these problems in practice, but there has been uh, a lot of progress in building quantum computers, and uh, some people say that it may just be a, a couple of decades until uh, quantum computers are able to um, break the crypto systems that we are using today. So that's a big uh, concern, obviously, for cryptography. So the idea of a lattice-based cryptography, or just lattice cryptography for short, is um, 
to say, instead of using all the mathematical structures that we have been using for the past 40 years, uh, which allow parties to communicate or compute securely in the presence of an attacker, as we have over here on the right, the idea is to use very different kinds of problems uh, and different mathematical structures called lattices to enable us to build crypto systems that will be secure. Um, and there are many reasons why one might be interested in doing this. First, uh, as we've just discussed, the quantum attacks which break today's cryptography uh, do not appear to break a lattice cryptography. We can't prove that, but people have put a large amount of effort into uh, attacking lattice problems and lattice crypto systems using quantum uh, algorithms. And so far, Shor's algorithm and, and other quantum algorithms have not uh, given a substantial uh, decrease in security of lattice-based crypto. A second reason is that the crypto systems that we build from lattices uh, often are very simple to describe uh, and to implement. Um, they have very simple kinds of uh, operations. Rather than working with very large uh, numbers, very large moduli or large primes, they work with very small numbers and are uh, highly parallelizable and involve linear <coughs> operations. So these are uh, highly efficient crypto systems in many cases that we obtain from lattices. And finally, there's a very interesting uh, theoretical property uh, that lattice-based cryptography offers us, which is uh, security from what are called worst-case hardness assumptions. Now, in cryptography, we need problems to be hard, but we need them to be hard on the average. That is, when someone generates a public key or generates a ciphertext, that is done using randomness, and the key and ciphertext are, are random objects. They have some randomness uh, to use to produce them. So it's not enough for uh, the problems that we use to be hard uh, in the worst case, they need to be hard on the average. And what uh, Niklos Aitai showed in uh, 1996, right around the time of, of Shor's breakthrough, uh, coincidentally, is that it is possible to obtain uh, the average case hardness that you need for cryptography, assuming only the worst case hardness of lattice problems. And so uh, this gives us additional confidence that the random uh, choices, random choices of keys and ciphertexts or whatever, whatever random objects appear in our crypto system, it gives us confidence that those are hard to break because um, that is based on a, only a worst case assumption, uh, not an average case assumption. So we'll have a lot more to say about what this means in the, in the coming slides, but these are four of the uh, main advantages or the points of interest uh, about lattice-based cryptography. So, are there any any questions at this point uh, that I can answer? So this is just the introduction and motivation uh, of, of why you might be interested in lattice-based cryptography. Now let's go into some of the um, actual formal mathematics and definitions. So we'll start with lattices and some of the hard problems that uh, are, are defined on them. For the purposes of today, and I think all weekend, um, uh, we'll define a lattice as, uh, well, we'll restrict our attention to what are called integer lattices. So an integer lattice is just a subgroup of the m-dimensional integers. So here we have, there we go. So we have the m uh, z, so the integers, uh, times itself, m times. And uh, a lattice is just a subgroup, uh, additive subgroup of, uh, of those uh, n-dimensional integers. So it contains uh, zero, the origin, and it, uh, it has the closure property. If you add two points in the lattice, the result is in the lattice. And also, any point in the lattice, its negation is also in the lattice. So you can see it here, here's a point, here's a negation over here. And likewise, if we take this point, and we add to it this point, we obtain uh, this point, which is the lattice. So if you, you can draw out a lattice uh, pictorially, and it looks something like a periodic grid going out into infinity uh, in all directions, and it's very regular. As you can, you can see here, uh, the structure of this is periodic and regular. Now a lattice is an infinite object. There are infinitely many points in the lattice um, in general. And 
but we can represent it uh, compactly in a, in a finite way with what is called a basis. So every lattice has a basis, and a basis consists of uh, some number of linearly independent vectors. So we name them b1, b2, and bk. And the lattice is obtained by taking all the integer uh, sums of these basis vectors. So for example, uh, here with this lattice of three points, we have the basis b1 and b2, are the two vectors. And if you just look at it for a while, you will see that every green point can be obtained by taking integer combinations of b1 and b2. For example, this point here is b1 plus b2. Uh, this point here is, uh, oh, that's a challenge. I suppose it's, uh, how do we get this point? Oh, sorry, this point here is b1 plus b2. Excuse me. Uh, this point here is 2 times b2. Uh, this is 2 times b2 plus b1, uh, and so forth. So in this case, uh, the lattice is generated by this basis. And today, and I, and I believe for the entire weekend, for simplicity, we will assume that the number of basis vectors is equal to the dimension uh, of the lattice. And such a lattice is called full rank. So here we have a full rank lattice. There are two basis vectors, and we're in two dimensions. So that's a, a full rank lattice. So this is one basis of the lattice, but it turns out that there are many bases of lattices. For example, these two vectors, b1 and b2 here, are a lattice, I'm uh, sorry, a basis of the exact same lattice. These are, this is the original basis, here is a different basis, but they both produce the same lattice. And if I had more room uh, on, the, on the screen, I would show you a basis made of very, very long uh, vectors which are, have a very small angle between them, uh, and it would be, it's possible to, to generate such a basis, I just can't uh, demonstrated on the screen because it's too small. So here we have uh, two different bases, and there are, uh, in general, infinitely many bases of a given lattice. There are also other representations, there are other ways of finitely describing a lattice, and we will see uh, another one of those ways uh, very shortly. So the interesting, there are many interesting things about lattices, but one interesting thing is that there uh, appear to be many uh, very difficult or uh, intractable problems uh, on lattices, conjecture part problems. And uh, essentially these problems relate to um, something relating to the geometry of the lattice, finding short, uh, short objects in the lattice or objects close to uh, the lattice. So for example, one of the Probably the most well-known uh, problem on lattices is what's called the shortest vector problem, or SVP, here. And the SVP is, uh, asks you, given a lattice, to find a vector which is uh, a shortest non-zero vector in the lattice. So here, this vector V is a shortest vector uh, in the lattice, shortest non-zero vector. That is, zero is always in the lattice, but not interesting, but uh, V is, the shortest, is a shortest non-zero vector in a lattice, uh, also negative V is this one as well. Sometimes we allow for uh, not necessarily a shortest vector, but one which is nearly shortest, so relatively short. Um, for example, if we are uh, allowed a small approximation or a small uh, loss in how short we are asking for, we might say that this point up here is also close enough to shortest. It's a little bit longer than shortest vectors, um, and so it might be an acceptable answer as well. Um, and in this context, we usually use a what's called an approximation factor, uh, gamma, which tells how much, uh, by what factor can you be larger than the shortest vector. There are other problems uh, relating to lattices which appear to be hard, for example, to estimate uh, various geometric quantities associated to the lattice. So for example, the minimum distance, uh, which is denoted by lambda 1, lambda sub 1, is the length of a shortest vector in the lattice. So the distance between the origin and V here is the minimum distance, or lambda 1, of the lattice. And so this uh, one, one problem that you can ask is to find the minimum distance of a lattice you don't necessarily have to find a shortest vector, but just find the length uh, of a shortest vector. And 
uh, similarly, there are other quantities called the successive minima, the covering radius, mu, and others. And it appears that all of these quantities are very difficult to uh, compute, even uh, approximately in lattices. One thing I should mention, if you're, if you're wondering and looking at this, and you, you say, well, none of these problems look very hard on the lattice that you presented. I can just look at that. Look at the lattice, and I can see that phi is clearly the shortest vector uh, in the lattice. So how could this be hard? And indeed, in, in two dimensions, which I've shown you here, uh, none of these problems are hard. They're all very easy. And we have known algorithms uh, from even the 19th, uh, sorry, the 1700s, um, which will solve these problems in two dimensions. But as the dimension increases to become very large in the hundreds or even thousands of dimensions, that is when these problems start to become uh, very intractable, very, very difficult uh, for computers. So uh, I wish I could show you a picture of a 1,000 dimensional lattice, uh, but I'm limited to two dimensions on the screen here. So uh, you'll have to use some imagination to think about what lattices look like in very high dimensions. And uh, that does take quite a while uh, to get used to. I, I'm not sure I know how to do it very well even, but uh, that's one of the more difficult things to do in this, in this subject is to try to uh, imagine very high dimensions and, and what lattices look like. So, yes, a question. Thank you. Yes, yes. So, in general, thank you. Uh, excellent, thank you. That, that's a great question. Uh, so, the question was, um, the gentleman's familiar with the definition of a lattice as being a subgroup in Rn, uh, reals to the n, the n-dimensional reals, rather than the integers, uh, n-dimensional integers that I've used today. Um, so there is a loss of generality in using um, integer lattices rather than real lattices. However, when it comes to computational uh, aspects of these lattice problems, uh, we have to write down uh, lattices. We have to write them uh, a basis, for example. And so you have to set some kind of precision uh, to the, if you're going to use real numbers, you have to set some kind of precision. And once you set some precision, you can scale uh, the real numbers by, up by some factor to then make everything integer. So from the point of view of computational uh, problems, there's essentially no loss of generality by using uh, integer lattices. And it makes uh, what we'll do this, uh, in, in cryptography, integer lattices are much more natural to work with. So thank you for the, the very good question. Uh, any other questions so far about the, these uh, definitions? So let's look a little bit closer at the uh, hardness or the complexity of uh, one of the most essential problems in lattices. This is the um, what's called the gap shortest vector problem with a factor of gamma, an approximation factor of gamma. So the formal definition of this problem is that we are given uh, an m-dimensional lattice, or a basis of such a lattice, as input. And we are also given a number d, which is positive. And what we want to do is, is determine whether the minimum distance of the lattice is at most d, or is much larger, is, that, is greater than uh, gamma. And this gamma may be a function If the, uh, if the lattice's minimum distance is between d and gamma times d, then either answer is correct. But when the lattice has a small minimum distance, at most d, then we should accept. And when the minimum distance is this large, we, should, uh, we must reject. So this is a computational problem. It has an input and a well-defined uh, output, uh, a well-defined correct output for each input. And, um, and the problem is simply to design an algorithm which will solve this uh, gap SVP problem. As you might expect, uh, as the approximation factor gamma becomes larger and larger, this problem uh, becomes easier because the gap between the guess case, between the, the small minimum distance and the large minimum distance case, grows larger and larger. So uh, as the gamma grows larger, uh, this problem becomes easier. And uh, here are some things that we know about this gap SVP problem. 
when the dimension, uh, sorry, excuse me, when the approximation factor is, is very small, for example, any constants, or uh, even uh, almost polynomial, so this is 2 to the uh, log of the dimension, but uh, raised to the one, almost 1 power, 1 minus x, 1 power. So this is not quite polynomial, but approaching uh, a polynomial. Then the gap SVP problem is uh, NP hard. Uh, at least NP hard with randomized reductions. So that was first shown by ITAI in 1998, and there have been many uh, subsequent works improving. Um, well, ITAI showed it for, I think, the exact version, and then the approximation factor has been uh, improved in many subsequent works. So down to these very low approximation factors, the problem is NP hard, and so we really do not expect there to be any efficient uh, algorithm for gap SVP with these small approximation factors. But what's interesting is that as we bring up the approximation factor to uh, a roughly square root of the dimension, at square root of the dimension, the problem is now known to be in uh, co-NP. In other words, we can prove that the, uh, we can efficiently prove to a verifier that the minimum distance is large, larger than the uh, square root m times d, and uh, the verifier will not be fooled if the uh, minimum distance is actually uh, less than d. So because the problem is in co-np, now we do not expect it to be np-complete uh, anymore. Right? Because for, for a co-np problem to be np-complete would cause a collapse of the uh, polynomial time hierarchy. So still, at these uh, small factors, the problem appears to be uh, difficult. It's just not NP hard. Uh, kind of when we move up the factor to something like linear in M, or a little bit more than linear in M, uh, now we can start to base cryptography on uh, this problem. So that is, assuming that gap SVP is hard for factors like this, in the worst case, we can build secure cryptographic uh, objects. And that's where we'll spend most of our time uh, in the talk today. And finally, when the uh, approximation factor is very large, roughly exponential in the dimension, we have polynomial time algorithms to solve uh, SVP at these very, very huge approximation gaps. Um, and this is known as the famous uh, LLL algorithm, and there have been many subsequent works which uh, which Fong will tell us about later uh, today and tomorrow. So there's a vast gap, uh, vast, you know, a vast world between uh, these kind of linear or polynomial factors which are used in cryptography uh, and the exponential factors that we know how to solve efficiently. Um, but what's really important for cryptography is that when the approximation factor is polynomial in M, Mentioned, the fastest algorithm that we have uh, requires exponential time as well as exponential space. Um, and that is a, uh, a famous, this was first shown by Aitai Kumar and Siva Kumar at the beginning of the century, and there have been many works uh, improving uh, on, on that result as well. But uh, this, this problem at polynomial factors appears to be exponentially difficult, uh, is the main, the main takeaway from this. Any questions about the, the complexity uh, of the Schroeder spectrum problem? Uh, this star here, this indicates that there's a randomized reduction problem, which so it's not officially empty hard, but it's essentially. Right, the worst case average case reduction, there is a, a polynomial time overhead. Uh, Oh, wait, yeah, yes. Uh, I will have a slide on that in, in just a couple of slides, which will explain that condition. Um, uh, but essentially, it loses at least a linear factor uh, in the approximation. Very good question. Any other questions about the complexity? So there are other problems, as we mentioned, uh, things like the shortest independent vector problem, and uh, similar, the, the complexity of these problems is, is similar um, to that of the shortest vector problem with polynomial factors appearing to be very hard, but not NP hard, and then exponential factors being easy.
So now we are in a position to uh, describe some of the, the basic uh, cryptographic problems that we use um, from lattices and uh, some of the constructions of crypto systems. So the, uh, the field really began with uh, Itai's work in 1996 in which he introduced uh, a, a problem which has now been called the short integer solution problem. And this is an average case problem. The inputs are chosen uh, at random and um, the problem is, is as follows. So first we're going to fix a dimension which I'll call n and a <coughs> integer modulus which I'll call q. And you can think of this modulus as being not very big, maybe uh, polynomial n, square, uh, n squared or n cubed or something not, not too large. So in contrast with the, um, the moduli we use in, in uh, RSA, for example, which are enormous moduli, these, these moduli q are, are rather small. And so I'll use the notation uh, zq to the n to denote uh, n-dimensional vectors whose entries are uh, integers modulo q. So all of the arithmetic is modulo q, and we have vectors of dimension n. And this is the SIS problem. Uh, in the SIS problem, we are given uh, several random vectors, a1, a2, up through am. And these are all n-dimensional uh, vectors in all q. And they're generated uniformly at random and independent of each other. And uh, think of them as being a very large number. So a large number of uh, these random vectors available to us. And the goal of SIS, or what, what the SIS problem is, is given these uh, many uniformly random a sub i vectors, the goal is to find a non-trivial uh, collection of integers z1 through zm, which are uh, ternary, so they are 0 or plus 1 or minus 1, with the goal that combining these random vectors using uh, z1 through zm sums up to 0. So that is, we are adding or subtracting uh, or leaving out each of the vectors a1, a2, through a1, and we would like them all to combine modulo q to add up to zero. So it may be that we take plus one of this, minus one of this, we leave this out by taking zm to be zero, and when we add all these up, we get zero. That's the that's solution. And we can write this a little more uh, compactly and, and conveniently using uh, matrix and vector notation, which is what I will do. So imagine uh, we, we will take each of these column vectors, a1, a2, through am, and treat them as the columns of a matrix, a single matrix A. So we have a single matrix A whose height is n, and there are m columns uh, to this matrix. So it's just a uniformly random matrix, modulo q. And now we're looking for a vector z, which is uh, short and non-zero, such that a times z is zero, modulo q. So it might be uh, a useful exercise right now to, uh, to think about whether this problem can be solved efficiently, <laughs> whether it's an efficient algorithm for this problem. And uh, one thing I'll, I'll just give as a brief exercise or question to you is, suppose we uh, ignore the short condition. So we ignore the condition that the z, uh, the zi should be 0 plus or minus 1. Uh, is it possible to solve this problem efficiently if we ignore the, the short uh, requirement. So I'll let, let you think about it for 10 seconds and uh, tell me if you can solve this problem. We have a brave volunteer. Professor Yu Yu knows the answer. So I'll give you a hint. This is not a very, it's not very difficult. When I tell you how to do it, you'll say, oh, of course. Maybe that's a good use. 
Okay, good. Uh, excellent. Gaussian elimination is one way to solve this problem. Um, as long as the matrix A is uh, square or, or wider than it is tall, um, you have you could apply Gaussian elimination and just solve uh, for Z, and you will get a non-zero solution to Z. Here's an even simpler uh, way to do it. Set the first coordinate of Z to be Q, and then all the other coordinates of Z to be zero. So uh, that, pre that technique predates Gaussian elimination, uh, but either technique will work. But what we notice, uh, if, you, if you think about this for a bit, if you apply Gaussian elimination here, you will uh, obtain uh, a solution Z. In fact, you'll obtain an entire uh, subspace of solutions Z, which all work. But, it, uh, but they will tend to have large entries in them. Their entries will be nearly as large as Q. Whereas we are looking for uh, a vector z whose entries are very small, maybe plus minus one or zero. So Gaussian elimination uh, does not seem to work here because it does not give us a short solution, although it does give us a non-zero solution. And so what makes this problem challenging and difficult um, is this requirement of shortness. Okay, so any, any question about that so far? Because what, oh yes, go ahead. How large should M be? Yes. So we need M to be large enough um, so that a solution exists. If no solution exists, it's very hard to find a solution. I think you would agree. Uh, and so I will tell you in a moment, actually I'll tell you right now how large M should be to guarantee that a solution exists. So here's the very first application of this SIS problem to cryptography, which is to build a collision resistant hash function. And uh, the, the function works as follows. We fix uh, a matrix A, so we choose this matrix A at random and treat it as the uh, key to the hash function. And then we define a function from the binary strings of dimension M, or length M, to ZQ to the N. And we will take M to be at least uh, N times the base 2 log of Q. And here's why we, we do this. Uh, so now the size of the input, size of the domain, is 2 to the m, which is strictly larger than uh, q to the n. So our domain is strictly larger than our range, and we are therefore guaranteed that collisions exist in this function. And so this function is simply defined as, uh, well, f of x is a times x. That's it. So a very simple matrix times vector multiplication is the definition of this function. Now I claim that this function is collision resistant as long as the SIS problem is hard. So if the SIS problem is hard, this function is collision resistant. It is difficult, it is infeasible to find two distinct inputs uh, that map to the same output. And the argument here is very simple. So while there do exist such collisions, it's hard to find them. And here's why. Uh, if someone did manage to find two inputs, x and x prime, which are different, but where ax equals ax prime, uh, then what can we do to solve SIS? We can just subtract and collect terms. So what we can say is that uh, by setting z to be x minus x prime, it is the case that a times x minus x prime is zero. And so therefore, this vector z, which is uh, non-zero and has plus minus one zero entries, is a solution to SIS. So for this random choice of A, finding a collision in this function is as difficult or, or gives us a solution to the SIS problem. And therefore, if the SIS problem really is hard, which we believe it is, uh, this function is collision resistant. Is there any question about uh, this so far? This is the most, uh, the very first cryptographic result uh, of this, this literature. Okay, so this seems great. Uh, this is very interesting. We have a very simple collision resistant hash function, uh, but what does this have to do with lattices? Um, and 
that's a great question. Uh, it turns out that it has a great deal to do with lattices. When we fix a matrix A, so when we have this random matrix A, which whose columns are the A1 through AM, uh, what we can do is define an associated lattice to this matrix A. And uh, in the literature, this is known as L perp or uh, L du L. Uh, well, not L, L perp, I guess. Okay, L perp. This is the set of all integer vectors such that AZ equals zero. So this is like the set of all solutions that you could get from, from Gaussian elimination without any restriction on the length. And it turns out that this is a lattice. It's easy to verify that this satisfies uh, the requirements of a lattice. Um, it is a subgroup of the m-dimensional integers. Zero is a solution. Any, uh, if, any if, if, if z is a solution, then negative z is a solution. And if x and y are solutions, then x plus y is a solution. So this uh, object here is actually a lattice in m dimensions, and it might look something like this. So without any restriction on the size of the solutions, you have this lattice. And one observation is that this lattice is periodic uh, over a big Q. So the vector uh, q comma zero is in this lattice, and the zero comma q, or you can put a q in any position uh, of, of the uh, vector and get a uh, lattice point. So really, the entire lattice is, is defined inside this, this box, and it's repeated in all uh, directions. Now the SIS asks for a short solution, one which is, uh, whose, whose norm is small. And so those solutions would lie inside of a, uh, a ball of small radius. In other words, the SIS problem is to find a relatively short vector in the lattice at L perp of A for a random choice of A. And so this actually, this SIS problem looked at in this perspective is a lattice problem. It's like a shortest vector problem or approximately shortest vector problem. Um, and as I mentioned before, this problem has a remarkable uh, connection between the average case and the worst case uh, uh, lattice problems, which is what was first shown by Aitai with, with many works following. And it says that any algorithm which can find a short uh, solution, okay, which can solve SIS with a uh, bound of beta on the length of the solution, so this is the Euclidean norm, if you can find uh, a solution of Euclidean norm at most beta, when beta is much less than Q, for a random choice of A, then you can convert such an algorithm into, uh, via a reduction, you can convert such an algorithm which solves the gap SVP problem to a factor of roughly beta times uh, square root of N. And what's remarkable is that this, this algorithm solves gap SVP on any n-dimensional lattice. No randomness, there's no uh, you know, random choice of, of lattice or anything like this for these problems. But if, if these problems are indeed hard, as we, as we believe and, and conjecture them to be, then uh, what this re result implies is that uh, the SIS problem is also hard uh, for a corresponding uh, bound beta. So this is really uh, an excellent uh, theorem, a really remarkable theorem. Uh, really, one one of, uh, of one of the kind, uh, and I, I want to make sure that you understand uh, what it means. So, happy to take questions or uh, any, any concerns about any of this material. Thing is this this result is uh, kind of tunable, right? We can set beta to be anything we want. We just need to allow we need to set q to be su substantially larger than beta, and then uh, the resulting problem, the resulting SIS problem with that bound beta, is at least as hard as gap SVP for.
for uh, a related factor. And so as beta increases, the problem, the SIS problem, you know, can only become easier. We have a, a more relaxed requirement on the solution. Um, but correspondingly, the gap SVP approximation factor is also going up uh, in, in proportion to our choice of data. So we should not choose beta to be exponentially large because these problems are easy for such large factors. But if you choose beta to be a polynomial in the dimension or um, maybe quasi polynomial or, or sub exponential, then uh, these problems are, appear to be hard and therefore the corresponding SIS problem is also hard. Exactly, yes. So this square root of n factor here uh, appears to be very difficult to remove. Uh, I think all the works in this line uh, have at least the square root of n factor uh, gap. It's a very interesting problem to try to remove that factor, but it's very difficult. Uh, which addresses Professor Yao's yeah, Professor questions in the floor as well. Uh, yes, question one. Uh, can you please uh, explain what the terminology is, what it is, and average place mean? Could you repeat? Can you explain what it does? Uh, can you please explain uh, what does the terminology was the case? An average, average case mean. Okay, so worst case uh, versus average case. An average case problem, uh, in an average case problem, the inputs are chosen at random from a specified distribution. In this case, the matrix A is uniformly random modulo Q. So uh, the attacker, or the, the algorithm that tries to solve SIS, may exploit uh, that fact, the fact that the input is chosen uh, uniformly at random. In addition, uh, actually, we are uh, happy with an attacker that solves the problem with uh, non-negligible probability. So even if it succeeds in only 1% probability or something like that, uh, that would be considered to be a, uh, an acceptable solver for the problem. So in the average case, again, the input is chosen at random, and the attacker only needs to succeed with some small but uh, measurable probability, uh, noticeable probability. On the average case, uh, I'm sorry, in the worst case, worst case problems, the attacker has to work for all possible inputs, and has to work with uh, probability one, or very close to one. So it could be a randomized algorithm, but it must succeed uh, with very high probability, and it must succeed on every possible input. Um, so that's a much stronger uh, condition, it's a much stronger requirement on the attacker, and therefore the problem it, it seems to make the problem more difficult. So as long as there are uh, hard inputs for these worst case problems, any hard input, maybe they're very difficult to find or they're very rare, but as long as there exists some hard inputs for these problems, this problem is hard for almost all matrices A, for, for random choices of A. And uh, again, as, as I said before, uh, our average case hardness is really essential to cryptography. We, we want our attackers to fail almost all the time, uh, even when we're choosing our keys at random. Very, very good question. Are there any other questions? <laughs> I see, yeah. So can we choose A from a, maybe a different distribution, uh, not uniform, but a different uh, Gaussian or small values? Uh, I see, smaller than, than Q, and yeah. smaller than Q. Right. Um, if you choose different distributions of A, the problem may become easy or easier. Uh, and it would depend on exactly which distribution you use. So, there are some things where, uh, some cases I think I can tell you that the problem becomes easy, and other cases uh, I don't know whether it's easier or still, still hard. Uh, yeah, any other questions about this? So I'd like to describe, we've already seen one uh, example of a of an application of SIS, which is the collision resistant hash function. 
But it turns out there are many, many more uh, cryptographic constructions which can be based on uh, SIS. And one exciting uh, application, at least to me, is uh, digital signatures. So for example, in, we, use, we have the RSA signature scheme uh, from you know, the late 1970s, and uh, it works by having a trap door. With a, it uses the fact that the factors of N, the prime factors of N, uh, allow that serve as a trap door, which allows us to perform certain operations that uh, people who lack the factors cannot do. And we'll have a similar kind of trap door structure uh, in this application as well. So there are many uh, high level similarities between uh, this, this signature scheme and the RSA scheme and others, uh, but the technical details are quite different. So in this digital signature scheme, we will uh, choose a, we will choose the public verification key to be a uniformly random matrix A, just like we have been uh, describing. But it turns out there's a way to generate such a matrix A together with uh, some trapdoor information, some secret information, which I will call T, uh, which will enable us to do certain operations efficiently that other parties can't do when they lack T. So again, the public verification key is A, and the signing key is this trapdoor T. In order to sign a message new, we will use this trapdoor. And at a high level, we will use this trapdoor to uh, choose a short random solution x to a times x equals uh, uh, some path. So what we'll do is we will uh, hash mu into zqn. And you can think of this as like a random oracle. So a random oracle or a random function maps our uh, message mu into zqn. And then our trapdoor allows us to randomly sample a short solution to AX equals hash. A little more concretely, we will uh, randomly draw X from uh, what's known as a Gaussian or discrete Gaussian distribution over the set of all possible solutions. So there are many solutions to AX equals this target. And uh, they, it turns out, if you, if you think about it for a moment, it turns out that uh, those solutions form a uh, lattice, or actually a shifted lattice. Uh, so on the previous slide, I showed you this lattice of helper. If you take this lattice and shift it in various ways, you get the set of all solutions to AX equals uh, some fixed hash value. So what we will do is we will draw X from a uh, Gaussian distribution over all possible solutions. And a nice fact about the Gaussian is it's very concentrated. So with very high probability, you get a uh, short vector x when you draw at random from this kind of distribution. Another really important uh, fact about this distribution is that it, it reveals nothing about the trapdoor. So our trapdoor will allow us to sample from this distribution, but this distribution doesn't, um, obviously, doesn't look, doesn't, uh, rely on T. So there's no information about the trapdoor, which is revealed by this distribution, just a nice round uh, Gaussian distribution. Uh, and so, essentially, the signing procedure here does not leak any information about the signing trapdoor, which is very important for security. And I'll show you on the next slide, actually, how to do this kind of sampling. But once we uh, do that, uh, we, produce, we have produced our signature. So we, we generate a, a short random solution to AX equals hash, and that solution X is our signature. So let's now see how to uh, verify the signature. So the verifier has a public key, has the public key A, a message new, and a signature, uh, but wants to check whether that signature is valid. And so what it will do is it will uh, hash the message as before to get the, the target hash value. And it will simply check whether AX equals the hash value. And it will check whether X is a sufficiently short solution. So uh, the, X is, the X that we draw from this distribution will be sufficiently short with high probability. And so a uh, valid signature or signature that we generate 
using this algorithm will verify uh, correctly. So such a signature uh, will, will look good. It will convince the verifier that it's a valid signature. But now let's think a little bit about um, the security of this system. Suppose that there is a forger who would like to uh, forge a signature on some new message, new from, from new stuff. So a forger would like to uh, forge a signature for the message new star. Well, in order to do so, it has to uh, cause the verifier to accept. So to make the verifier accept, it has to find some short vector x star such that a times x star equals the hash of new star. Because the verifier checks this equation and also checks that x star is sufficiently short. But if you think about this for a moment, uh, what we're asking for is a short solution to a times x star equals a random, uh, random hash value of new star. And this is essentially exactly the SIS problem. This is the hard problem of SIS, uh, again, which is to find uh, a short solution to ax star equals some target uh, on the right hand side. So what we have in, in total here is the uh, actual signer generates signatures according to a distribution which does not reveal any information about the uh, signing key, the trapdoor. And in order to forge a signature, you have to solve the SIS problem. Yes, so this is a scheme that works in the random oracle model. And uh, there's been follow-up work which removes the random oracle uh, at the cost of uh, a bit worse efficiency in various ways. So, uh, yeah, this is just the kind of the first step, and then there's many works which improve uh, the signature scheme in various ways. So I should say, this is just a, a kind of a high-level uh, description of the scheme and why it's secure. Of course, we need a real reduction and a real security proof, uh, which I will refer you to the papers for this. So are there any, any questions about the, the high-level picture here on um, this signature scheme? Yes? Could you explain uh, how to uh, generate the uh, uh, capital? Could you? Oh, how to generate the trapdoor. Uh, so in the first step, uh, we have to generate this random matrix A together with a suitable trapdoor. Um, it's very interesting. Um, it turns out to be, well, the initial constructions of this were, were very complicated. And now we have a very simple construction. Um, so with Daniele Machencio and I, we gave a, a very simple construction which shows how to produce such a trapdoor uh, in a matrix A. So um, I would refer you to this paper. I don't have I don't have slides on how to do it, but it's it turns out to be very simple. It can be described in about a page. So um, I'll, I'll point you to that paper where we can discuss afterward. It's a very good question. How do we how do we generate this trapdoor in a matrix A? What would what what would uh, what would uh, what would happen if we sign the same message for many times? Ah, excellent question. Okay, so this is a very astute question, um, and the question is, what happens if we are asked to sign the same message uh, multiple times? And you may notice that there may be a little problem uh, here if you do that. Um, the hash of the message is the same. Both times, or all three times, or however many times we're signing that message, the hash is the same, but we would uh, choose a fresh random, or we might choose a fresh random x from this distribution. And it turns out that if you get even two values uh, drawn from this distribution, their difference lies in the lattice uh, L purple A. It's an easy thing to verify. And uh, that is a short uh, solution to, to SIS. And, and so that's actually catastrophic for security. So there are a few ways that uh, you can address this problem. This would be, uh, because it's, it's very bad if this, if this happens, honestly. One way that you can address it is by randomizing the hash uh, every time you sign. 
So we might take mu as well as some additional random uh, salt or some extra random parameter and include it in the input to the hash. And now when we uh, sign the same message multiple times, we end up with different hash values. And then the, the problem is, uh, is, is not a problem anymore because we're using a different distribution each time, uh, even though we're signing the same message multiple times. Another possibility is to, um, and this, this is an old technique, it's to uh, de-randomize the sample so that you actually, you could use a pseudorandom function or uh, an object like that to deterministically sample from this uh, distribution. You use a pseudorandom function to uh, uh, draw at random from the distribution, but you draw the same x every time you are uh, sampling from the same, for the same u. So those are a couple of ways you can handle it. There are others uh, as well, and it's sort of what, what is more preferable. But I think the randomized hashing is a simple way to uh, address this question. There's a question here. Yes. So the question is, how can we ensure that uh, x satisfies ax equals the hash? And, and again? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's the question. Okay. Uh, I will show on the very next slide how this uh, sampling procedure works um, and, and why it satisfies the uh, relationship that we want. Okay. Is there uh, any other questions? Yes. Very good. Very good. Yes. Yes. Okay. Excellent question. Uh, you are you're keeping me honest. Uh, I lied a little bit here, which is I said that uh, a x star equals hash of mu star is the S I S problem, but as you pointed out, the S I S problem is actually we want a x star equals zero, and this is not zero. It's not likely. To um, however, the SIS problem is very nice. Um, this generalization where the right-hand side is a randomly chosen uh, target is also, uh, we can also consider it the SIS problem, and it is hard. Uh, it has the same hardness property that I, uh, that I showed the worst case average case connection. Um, another thing that you can uh, think about is, let's just move this right-hand side and subtract it uh, over to the left. And we can treat this vector here, this hash vector, as just one more column of A. And then the x star has a, a negative 1 corresponding to that column. And so now we have uh, a sort of A prime, or some x, A with an extra column, times a short x star equals 0. And so it is, it is SIS if we just move things uh, to the left-hand side. Very good question. Uh, was there another question over here? Yes. Yeah. What's the connection between using T shot mass and the Floyd X on distribution? So what is the connection between using T to sample a short X and and the Floyd X from distribution? And drawing X from this distribution. Huh. So the tractor T is what allows us or what enables us to be able to, to sample efficiently from this distribution. Uh, a party that does not have the trapdoor cannot do this. Uh, can't even find a single solution in this uh, support of this distribution because that is the SIS problem. So the trapdoor allows us to solve the SIS in a very strong way. It allows us to not only find a solution but to randomly sample from a uh, set of all such solutions according to this distribution. So that's what the signer can do with the trapdoor that, that others cannot do, we only have the public. 